Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant and we welcome you to Kentucky Newsmakers. A little departure this morning from the purely political. Kentucky's drug plague continues to worsen. We'll get an update on that. The latest from WKYT investigative reporter Miranda Combs. On a more encouraging note, Kentucky's tourism numbers are climbing and the state tourism commissioner Kristen Branscombe will talk about the benefits of visitors spending their vacation dollars here in the Commonwealth. Also, why a Kentucky native who now lives in California decided that his home state was the best place to shoot a feature film. Brian Sexton will be talking about how Kentucky is becoming an attractive place to make movies. That's coming up later. Let's begin with Miranda, who is here right now. Kentucky's terrible drug problem worsens. The state's largest city of Louisville, the coroner there, is begging for more resources to keep up with a growing number of overdose deaths. And an even more potent form of fentanyl is showing up, forcing emergency personnel to administer more Narcan to revive overdose victims before they die. Miranda, it just keeps happening, doesn't it? The, the drug plague just keeps getting worse. It just keeps getting worse, and it's filtering out into multiple areas of society that never would have been touched by it. We did the story that always strikes me on the heart surgeon having to replace heart valves in 20-year-olds because the needles that they're using were causing infections, and they're replacing these heart valves when heart valves are meant for people yeah. that are in their later years of life. So it is affecting every aspect of society. The first responders are so overwhelmed. The police sometimes who can get there quickly before an ambulance even arrives are so often having to uh, try to revive uh, uh, overdose victims. And something that's coming out of that is they're using Narcan in many cases. Many police departments have their own Narcan, but they don't even have enough with them sometimes these days to revive some of these patients because they carry, what, two with them at a time and they're using it all. Then they don't have any. You have to order more. Well, next thing you know, they're going on another overdose call and don't have any with them. So it's causing a lot of ripple effects and police are getting really concerned about their supplies. Isn't it frequently the case that they are going back to the same victims sometimes in a tight time frame? One of the stories that struck me the most and I can't remember right now when we shot it maybe January of this year in northern Kentucky where they said so when when, a, when an EMS shows up at the scene and they administer Narcan, that patient has a choice of whether or not they want to go to the hospital or not. They don't have to go. So what's happening is they're leaving, not going to the hospital, and the first responders are showing up again three hours later to revive them again. How frustrating would that be from a police department standpoint to bust it to get out to these scenes and then they don't even want the help, the long-term help that's much needed. And as uh, you were mentioning earlier, this is uh, going out into all areas of society. Some employers are now telling us they're giving up drug testing. They could not fill their staff positions if they did, in, including in uh, some restaurants apparently. And you heard that. I mm -hmm. haven't had anyone that's willing to admit that on camera because obviously they don't want to let that be known. But yes, I'm also hearing that that's the case, that they don't want to do the drug testing because they wouldn't have enough employees. We were down in southern Kentucky in the fall and they were talking about the fact that they have these job fairs and no one will even show up to the job fair. So it's not like the jobs aren't there. They just can't find the employees to fill the jobs. And then when they do do drug tests, they're losing 60% of their staff in one fell swoop. So what are they supposed to do? The AG has also spoken out about the fact that they can't get businesses to come into Kentucky right now because of the drug problem, because they know they won't be able to find the employees. So the administration is uh, working hard, trying to identify potential employers and bring them in, but one of the questions is, uh, can you have, find the workforce? Right, yeah. and I think they're even using our stories to help promote the problem and help people understand how bad the problem is on a state level. Fentanyl is being mixed with something else and making it even more lethal? Here's what it is. It's different analogs of fentanyl, okay? So mm -hmm. th there's many different analogs, but as different ad analogs come into the state, they're stronger, they're more potent. So they're not getting the same effects from that naloxone, which is what you use to yeah. treat an opioid overdose. It's not having the same effect. Basically, Basically, a very simple way it was explained to me is the more potent the fentanyl is, we talked about this acryl fentanyl on Thursday night, um, it's so potent that it's hitting these receptors
receptors in the brain and then the naloxone isn't able to get to that same receptor or it's at least taking the naloxone a lot longer. So at one point when they were decided two years ago using a half a dose of naloxone to bring someone totally back, now it's taking three, four doses or even a, an intravenous line of this naloxone to bring people back. They just aren't able to, to get them back because these drugs are just so potent and so dangerous. What is old is new again and coming up this week uh, you're going to be uh, airing a report about meth mm -hmm. making a comeback. So it's the most number one uh, seized drug in Kentucky, which may surprise a lot of people because heroin takes the headlines. Obviously, heroin is a lot more fatal in a lot of cases than meth. But here's the kicker. This meth is actually, they call it ice down in Williamsburg, your neck of the woods, because it looks like ice. It's called crystal meth. And it's much more potent. Back in the days of the bathtub crank labs, it was like 40 to 50% purity. Now we're talking about 90 to 100% pure. It's coming in from Atlanta. Atlanta, from Louisville, and we're just getting hit with it hard in Richmond, uh, Williamsburg, areas like that, and really all over the state. When we went to the state crime lab, I said that is absolutely the number one drug we see in the lab right now is crystal meth. All right, Miranda, I know you cover other things, but it seems that... <laughs> that the, one swamps the, me from time uh, to time. Right, yes. just a, an mm -hmm. awful problem for the state. Thank you uh, for coming in. Mm -hmm. And coming next on Kentucky Newsmakers, movie producer Brian Sexton, who grew up in Kentucky, returns to Lexington to shoot a horror movie, why he says that made business sense coming up. And later, the State Tourism Commissioner on some impressive numbers for the Commonwealth. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers. A mansion along Winchester Road in Lexington has been lit up at night in recent weeks, making it the perfect setting for a horror movie. The producer of the movie The Wiccan now lives in California, but Brian Sexton says it made sense for several reasons for him to return to the bluegrass where he grew up to shoot this film. And Brian is good enough to join us here on the Kentucky Newsmakers. Thanks for coming in. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Before we roll into what your project is now, you have uh, dropped some names. You've done some pretty major projects here over the years you've been in California. Well, I, I was lucky enough to get started, uh, you know, on Wedding Crashers, Hellboy, um, Freddy vs. Jason, those kinds of films. Uh, um, and then, uh, you know, kept kept working my way up in the business. I mean, it uh, is definitely slow and steady as the race, as they say. And, um, you know, I, I just kept getting fortunate and to, to be hired on some pretty great films. And now The Wiccan, which is being shot uh, here at Lexington. You say Kentucky made sense as a place to do this for a variety of reasons. Why? Yes, sir. Uh, Kentucky is beautiful. I mean, it's my home state, obviously, but I mean, it, it's it's a beautiful backdrop. And every time I'm, I'm watching a TV show or a film, I'm like, you know, why isn't this stuff being shot here? Um, and I was, you know, I'd always told my mom and my sister who, who still live here, you know, I, I wish that they would um, that they would start an incentive um, for the state uh, because I would I would film in Louisiana I would film you know around the world where they would provide an incentive you know the entire country of Canada provides an incentive um, and you know they very smartly um, came up with a a great incentive for producers to bring outside financing and investment to the state to hire local crew and to provide taxes and and revenues for the state of Kentucky and to get people to to notice Kentucky and it, you know uh, put it on the map. So you're taking advantage of that and is this also a more uh, economically feasible place for you to do your work as a result of that? Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, it, it'd be a lot uh, harder for us to make this kind of movie um, in California, uh, to be quite honest. Just, I mean, the locations, um, you know, you go to California, there's not a lot of buildings that are, are this kind of uh, date. Um, you know, the house that we're shooting in 1929, um, it's... Uh, you know, it's it's pretty special place. We're looking so. at it now. Why was that the perfect scene for a horror movie called The Wiccan? <laughs> <laughs> I would say the the inside uh, matches our our script to a T. It is you know obviously when you go in, you, it's not a place that you're going to want to spend the night. Um, but the the uh, I'd say the house is in in pretty great condition otherwise. How's the project coming along? 
it's going great. I mean, we've, you know, we've had uh, ups and downs. Obviously, you know, our I think everybody knows our, our hotel caught caught on fire the other day. But aside from that, uh, you know, things have been going great with with the actual filming. Uh, tell us just a little bit about the movie itself. What uh, what really is the plot? So it's a group of kids, small town America. Uh, they get bored one uh, Halloween evening, and uh, they're not supposed to go into the the house at the end of the block, and that's that house, and. Uh, you know, they wind up going in and can't get out. <laughs> of course they do, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so you, you, you take it from there. What was your path uh, from uh, growing up uh, here in Lexington to ending up in California, where you said really it would surprise people how many people from here are out there uh, in, in the movie industry? Absolutely, there's a, there's a ton of people from from Lexington and Kentucky. Period out there. I mean, you know, I constantly meet more and more people who are UK fans or U of L fans, and you know, it's um, it's it's really cool. But you know, as far as uh, you know, my path, I was I was fortunate enough to get a couple internships in New York, and then met a director who who hired me in out L A. Yeah. So you've been there now for for several years. I've been there for 16 years. Is now. it home yet? Um, you know, that's it, it, it. I go back and forth, Kentucky, L.A., but, yeah, I mean, 16 years is, is a long time, and, I, you know, I suppose I have to call that my, my home at the moment, but I, but I, you know, my whole family is here, yeah. so I, I can't ever say Kentucky. This is my home. So. This is home, home, home right? Home, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when will be, uh, people be able to see The Wicked, and what will be uh, its distribution? So we're hoping for uh, for uh, a Halloween um, release this year, 2017, if we can get it uh, out quick enough. Um, Distribution-wise, uh, we're looking at theaters and and probably a small release, uh, New York, LA, and kind of spreading from there. And so you're going to be editing pretty quickly over the uh, the summer and fall, right? Yes, sir. It's already it's already in the works. You do that digitally these days, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what else? What's coming next? Do you think after this, will you come back to Kentucky, make another film? Uh, I absolutely hope so. I, I'm uh, you know, as as a producer, you always have like 20 balls up in the air, and you never know what's going to happen. It's you know, you work on these things for a long time, and you just hope one of them lands, and then you know pieces start to come together and um, Kentucky has been honestly a, a great place for for the past two films. Well uh, the uh, inconvenient hotel fire had to be the worst thing that's happened. What has been the best thing about working uh, here in your home state for a few weeks? You know I, I'd say uh, people's generosity and and the attitude that that's on set. I, I have an amazing crew. Uh, the fire department uh, has has been helping us uh, you know almost every day out there with safety and, you know, um, providing kind of uh, uh, supervision on stunts and that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, it's like, it, it, it's just a welcoming place. And, you know, everybody is, is, is it's just, a, it's, a, it's a great place to work. Brian, thanks for coming by. Really appreciate it. Good luck, uh, certainly uh, in the future. We do appreciate you being here. Kristen Branscombe of Kentucky Tourism coming next on Kentucky Newsmakers. And we hope you'll keep it right here for that. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers. We're glad you're with us here on WKYT. People are coming to see us here in Kentucky. Tourism numbers have shown the biggest jump since 2005. Kentucky really has it all with history, horses, natural beauty. Our mountains and lakes are ready for adventure. The Bourbon Trail has opened up a whole new way of seeing our Commonwealth. And as you know, we Kentuckians are just interesting people, right? Kristen Branscombe is Kentucky's Travel Commissioner. She heads up the strategy for selling our state as a destination. Nation. Welcome. Congratulations on those uh, those numbers. They're Thank quite impressive. Oh, very impressive. Thank you so much for having me here today. Talk about tourism. Let's do that. Uh, how does it make you feel to see $14 billion in economic activity now from tourism alone in Kentucky? I think it shows what we've all known. You know, we have, a, like you said, a fantastic state, uh, fantastic people, and now we're really developing those strategies to tell the world about us and to get visitors here. But $14.5 billion, I think that makes us the third largest revenue generating industry in Kentucky uh, behind automobiles and healthcare. And that's 193,000 uh, tourism supported jobs. So that's incredible, about 10% of our Kentucky workforce. 
So what is uh, contributing to this? How are we, uh, what are we doing right right now? Um, right now, I think we're just in a really good position uh, with everything that we have to offer. A lot of people want to get a little taste of Americana. They want to see the real America, and we can provide that. And also with uh, internationally, the Canadians at the drive market, uh, we're close. I think people in our contiguous states, they're coming around. And usually we see a lot of northerners coming down, but now we're seeing southerners come up. Uh, people in the Deep South, people in North Carolina and Virginia, they're coming over to see what Kentucky has to offer. So we're really starting to branch out aside from just the Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. Do you think part of it is that we've sort of uh, discovered ourselves here, that, uh, you know, that our history is interesting, that uh, the bluegrass music is rich uh, with heritage, that, uh, you know, uh, some of the places that we had uh, written off as far flung in the state are really great places to go see? I would agree with that 100%. I think Kentuckians are really starting to appreciate the Kentuckiness of us and really have a great amount of pride uh, in our state and in our areas. And the best thing that we can do, I mean, we've got tourism offices all across the state, but the best hosts, the best advocates for our, our counties, our communities, and the state are the people themselves. And I think when people see Okay, tourism, you know, means money. Uh, on average, I think this last go around in 16, it saved folks, each uh, household, about $300 in taxes. So I think people are starting to make that connection that tourism does work for our state. Um, and then they're like, you know what, I really want to show off our state. And they take that pride and they really are out there and talking to our guests and talking to friends and family across the country to come here. Well, that really is interesting when you lay it out there in that way that uh, for every dollar that is generated, generated in uh, tourism money, that's a dollar that we don't have to uh, have in, in tax or revenue for the state, right? Absolutely. Um, so tourism in 16, these numbers that came out, about $1.5 uh, billion in taxes is what the tourism industry brought in. So that is all outside money. And that's fantastic. That's state and local taxes that, you know, we don't have. It's not on the backs of our citizens. Uh, so the more folks that we come in, that we get into the state, they have a good time. They have good memories. Their perception of Kentucky changes, but they also leave their money with us. And I think that's key uh, in developing our economy in Kentucky as we go forward. As you said, the employment numbers in tourism have climbed to about 193,000, I think, and it would be fair to say I think it looked like the trajectory was on pace to, we've probably eclipsed 200,000 at this point. What are people doing in those jobs? Um, the tourism industry is an interesting industry because it could be anything from the folks at a marina uh, that are checking you in, you know, signing you up, getting your houseboats, to your housekeeping staff, to your front desk staff at a hotel, uh, people taking the, the tickets at an attraction, uh, museum museum workers, but it's also the people, uh, we take a percent of the restaurant uh, industry, not the whole percent, but a percent of that because these restaurants are, uh, d you know, kind of, they have to have that tourism money coming in, and it's not just local money. So those are the people that are accounted in those jobs. Uh, also, like National Park workers, when you look at Mammoth Cave, for example, those are the people that are counted in those numbers. And what do we do to invest in those those workers to ensure that they are good, uh, uh, they're well trained on hospitality, for instance, and that uh, sort of thing? You get the impression we could improve there. We, we can, and I think that's part of the problem too, especially in Kentucky, we see a lot of seasonal staff. Uh, you know, at, during the summer, everybody's going, I keep going back to these lakes because it's getting hot out there, it's time to get out in the water. But you know, we see a lot of uh, part-time workers come in and then even restaurants. You have a lot of people that are more transient in the tourism industry. Uh, so it's hard to really develop those programs for hospitality, but I think we are making those strides to get better. And I think the interesting part about tourism is you could start off as a, a, a bellhop or a valet parker and end up you know, being manager of the hotel uh, in your life. So there's a lot of room for advancement, which I think is really interesting in the tourism industry and even in the restaurant industry. You know, you're a dishwasher and then the next next day you're a, a, an executive chef. So a lot of upward mobility where some industries are just kind of pigeonholed where you are. So you try to get the word out there that those opportunities are there. Uh, spring has brought us Keeneland and the Derby season. Uh, how important is that in getting the year off to a good start? I tell you, Keeneland just, you know, tees it up perfectly. Everybody kind of gets ready, gets out of that winter funk. Then the Derby, May is the best time in Kentucky. Not just because of the Derby, but for tourism. We start off with the Derby, you know, the international eyes are all on us. People are thinking, oh, hey, Kentucky, 
great place to see, love these horses, beautiful vistas, we want to go. But then we follow that right up with Kentucky Tourism Week, which is part of National Travel and Tourism Week, which where we announced our great numbers. Uh, and then we're moving right into Memorial Day. How great is that? I mean, that's right here upon us. Um, and we are kicking off 99 days of summer. That's going to go from Memorial Day to Labor Day. So if you don't know what you're going to do here in a couple of weeks, Bill, to uh, get out and enjoy Kentucky. We have 99 days, of, and there's something every day for you to enjoy. How much do uh, do festivals and community events like downtown uh, uh, events, uh, you know, the, the, the dances, the street events that they have, how much does that add to the numbers? You know, a lot of those, um, it, it depends. You know, if it's more of a local festival and it's not, you know, broadcast out a lot, you know, it's a lot of local, a lot of people in contiguous counties. But but these festivals that we have in Kentucky are just incredible. And they are internationally known festivals. I was just at the Owensboro International Barbecue Festival. I mean, first time I'd been there. It was incredible, the amount of people. And when you look at the cars and the license plates, where they're from, it's not just Kentuckians. It's not just folks that are up in Indiana. There's a lot of people coming in to see what we have to offer. As the, uh, the uh, summer travel season gets going, gasoline prices seem to be steady. Uh, th that is a, an encouraging factor. The road construction projects, though, get underway as well. Is there always going to be a rub between tourism and transportation, and that's when they have to get this work done, but at the same time, it slows people down trying to get to their destinations? Yeah, you know, there's always that frustration. You know, people want to get where they want to get and get there quick. Uh, but I, I, I choose to look at it positively. If we didn't have that investment in our infrastructure, we couldn't get people to where they need to be. And uh, we certainly don't want visitors coming into Kentucky and, you know, just it be like a roller coaster and, and hitting bumps all down the interstate. So we, we try to take that with a grain of salt and appreciate that we actually have that investment into our roads. Uh, overnight stays are still very important, right? If you get to people to stay here a, a night or two, uh, that's better than just uh, stopping off for fast food on your way zipping through, right? Absolutely. You know, Kentucky has been known as a, a drive-through state, uh, which is quite unfortunate, but because we have a lot of folks that are using 75, you know, to head south and go to Florida, whether they're snowbirds or they're hitting the beach, uh, they kind of just breeze through Kentucky. So a lot of our marketing has been directed to those people that are like, hey, stop, stop and see us for a while. Don't have weekend plans. Stay, you know, here's some of our weekend plans in Kentucky. So if we can and get them for two days, three days, a long weekend. Once they get here, they're going to see what Kentucky has, and we think they're going to stay longer or they're going to come back and stay for a while. How is this Kentucky Bourbon Trail pushing things along? We just continue to hear some pretty strong results out of that. You know, uh, the Kentucky Bourbon Trail and that all of our bourbon distilleries, our craft distilleries, it is such a wonderful asset for us to have. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that, are, that say, oh, I don't drink bourbon, I don't drink. But what we have in Kentucky that they don't have a lot of places is that each of our distilleries are they're so very unique they each have their own stories they each have uh a different part of their, you know, whether it's an art installation or a restaurant or a cool activity on there, that you can really go to each distillery and it'd be different. So I think that is the draw that we have that, you know, if bourbon ever falls out of favor, which I have no clue why that would ever happen, um, but if it ever did, we still have these distilleries that are just wonderful attractions. It's so interesting for people to get involved with. The Newport Aquarium, uh, a major draw to uh, northern Kentucky, and they continue to, uh, to try to develop the things along the, the river up there, right? Yes, um, I think Northern Kentucky is very interesting. Uh, a lot of people have seen it just as, you know, that little stop right before you go over to Cincinnati. Uh, but they are really investing into that, that riverfront. They're investing into those counties that are um, surrounding, you know, Covington and really trying to focus on the history that they have in Northern Kentucky, expanding attractions like the aquarium. Uh, obviously the Ark is a massive draw. If you noticed in the 16 numbers, Grant County increased their tourism numbers by 128%. Uh, and that was due to the Ark. And that is allowing people, you know, they may be coming for the Ark, but that's a good opportunity to take them to the aquarium, take them uh, throughout, you know, all of Northern Kentucky to experience what they have. When you uh, look across Kentucky, there uh, are various efforts by the localities trying to, uh, to, to do things, and some do better than others in, in telling their story and in luring uh, people in. What is the, usually the best practice uh, when a, a community does the best it can with its local uh, tourism promotional dollars to try to get word out? You know, we have a lot of communities, like you said, that really get it, but a lot of them, you know, their resources are limited, so they really have to be smart about 
about how they use that money. Uh, thankfully, digital, uh, social media, that provides some opportunities that are a little bit more cost effective. But what really is key with our communities is having an entire community that supports the tourism industry. Uh, everybody singing from the same hymnal, if you will, uh, whether that's the judge, the mayor, the tourism office, and everybody in between really being the promoters. And that's what's key is everybody on board uh, talking about that community in a positive way. You could really feel it when you go into a town where uh, somebody says they're from somewhere else and somebody just says, well, well welcome to Richmond or well, welcome to Mount Sterling or whatever, you know, because uh, uh, it, it means a lot to, to visitors, doesn't it? It does, and you know, I've, I've had the opportunity in the past two weeks to talk to some people, different couples from uh, Los Angeles, and it's very interesting to hear everyone's perspective of Kentuckians actually speak to you. They smile. That doesn't happen everywhere in the country, and I think, you know, we don't even think about that. You know, we, that's what you do. You smile, you nod, you say hello, and you say welcome. Um, and a gentleman yesterday from L.A. said, you know, as soon as you're, you come here, you meet a Kentuckian, automatically you're family. And he said, I love that. And they're talking about moving a business here just because of Kentuckians and our hospitality and just how we just take people in. That's a great story. There was a little uh, mistake in the uh, tourism uh, report that came out, and you have apologized your office to the uh, Corbin Cumberland Falls area because their numbers were stronger than were reflected in that first report. Oh yeah, Bill, that was that was horrible. You know, Whitley County numbers it showed a decrease, um, and the tourism offices in that community, the hotels, the attractions. I, I have seen firsthand over the last year how hard they are working to promote that area. And so when we saw that, we knew something was wrong. Um, and I, I talked to the Corbin office. We talked, we looked, I said, did you have something closed? Did people respond to the surveys? What, what is it? Went back to the research company and unfortunately there was a typo. So uh, Corbin, Whitley County, they're doing great things. They increased a couple of million dollars uh, and I think that they're going to be doing great things in the future. So yeah, definitely mea culpa on our part, but all is well. Kristen Branscombe is Kentucky's Travel Commissioner. Thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you for having a little me. Seasonal update for us. That is Kentucky Newsmakers. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you bright and early this week on WKYT This Morning. We hope you make it a good week ahead.